Good afternoon and welcome to the Penn State Alumni Association's virtual speaker series. It is good to see the room filling up here on our brand new platform on 24. You can customize your experience by using the toolbar at the bottom of the screen or minimize the features available for you at today's event. You can View the closed captioning by clicking the CC button in the toolbar at the bottom of the screen. And as always, please feel free to drop any questions for our speakers in the ask questions box. And if you are having issues, you can always um, drop those issues in the attendees chat and tech support will help you troubleshoot. Once again, welcome to the Penn State Alumni Association's virtual speaker series. We have a great program lined up for you today. Today, joining us this afternoon, Tracy Lankilday. She is the Dean of Penn State's Eberly College of Science. Uh, we are excited to have her joining us on today's edition of the Virtual Speaker Series. Again, in the attendee chat, let us know who you are and where you're watching from today. And make sure that you drive your questions into the Q&A box and we will try to get to as many of those at the end as possible. Today's session is brought to you by the generosity of Matthew and Karen Keller, both 2000 graduates of the Everly College of Science and loyal supporters of the Penn State Alumni Association. They are great supporters of the virtual speaker series and we thank them for their support. Where else would you rather be? Good afternoon, Penn Staters, and thank you for joining us. I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association, and I'd like to welcome everybody to today's virtual speaker session, which is being recorded. Today's virtual speaker session is made possible through the generosity of Matthew and Karen Keller, both 2000 graduates of the Eberly College of Science and loyal supporters of the Penn State Alumni Association. The Kellers created a new program endowment at the Alumni Association and are sponsoring an annual event that features the Eberly College of Science, its professors and students. Today's virtual speaker session is the inaugural event in this program titled, titled the Keller Family Alumni Experiences in Science Series. We are encouraging you to participate in today's discussion based on the features made available in the audience console you can view slides, hear the presenter via the main stage, submit questions to the presenter through the Q&A box, view closed captions, and much, much more. This afternoon, we welcome Tracy Lane Kilda. She is the Dean for Penn State's Eberly College of Science. Tracy made history after becoming Eberly College of Science's first female Dean. <clears throat> While the college has been built on the shoulders of successful leaders, since its founding in 1859, Dean Lankilda has broken a glass ceiling and aspires to change the perception of what a scientist looks like. Tracy will share her path to leadership and how she approaches her position as a role model for future leaders. She shares her vision with the university to empower people of all backgrounds, to use science to solve the world's problems, and will highlight exciting initiatives that may help realize this goal. Tracy was appointed Dean of the Everly College of Science in August of 2020. She began her academic career in 2007 as an assistant professor of biology at Penn State and served as the department head of biology from 2016. She has been a leader in graduate and undergraduate education programs in biology and has championed several initiatives advancing inclusion, equity, and diversity, and promoting excellence in research and education. Dean Lankilda earned her bachelor's and doctorate degrees in Australia before pursuing her postdoctoral studies at Yale. For her research on adaptations of animals to changes in their environment, Lankilda was named the Distinguished Herpetologist the field's top honor in 2019 and 2011. Thanks for joining us, Lane Kilda. 
Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you. It is fantastic to kick off the Keller Family Alumni Experiences in Science series. As you know, Matt and Karen Keller are extremely dedicated alums to the university and have made an important impact on the Eberly College of Science. So this is really exciting for me and it is so great to have them join us today. I became the Vern M. Willeman Dean of the Eberly College of Science in October, 2020. To be honest, I did not fully understand or appreciate all that this position involved when I applied. And I've not regretted this decision for a minute. It is so exciting to build on the efforts and successes of so many incredible leaders since the college's founding. Over more than 150 years, our scientists have been instrumental in imaging the first atom, developing building blocks of computer science and programming languages, laying the foundation for the development of the birth control pill, helping to prevent the spread of infectious disease, and so much more. And our students, many of you here today, are using science to help change the world. Science is super important and way too cool to be exclusive. And we're making some progress. So let me share my screen. So you probably have seen this exercise where we ask children to draw a scientist as a way to ask them what they think, who they think can be scientists without actually asking them. A recent study compiled information on such pictures over five decades. That's over 20,000 pictures drawn by students aged five to 18. And this shows that this perception is shifting to become more gender diverse. And Kari, for anyone who's excited about reading more about this study, Kari will drop the link to this paper in chat. But in the 1960s and 70s, less than 1% of school-aged children depicted scientists as female. This increased to 34% by 2016. And for drawings penned by girls, over 50% depicted women scientists. This is a really impressive shift. This diversity in perception of what a scientist looks like, however, was less prevalent as children grew older. So we think that this reflects that even though scientists have started to become more representative of the broader population over time, children are not being exposed to this diversity. And so their views of a scientist become more limited as they get older. And the scientists they draw are still predominantly represented as white and able-bodied. And so we still have a lot of work to do. But this shows how important it is to expose school children to scientists from diverse backgrounds and to engage them in science. Doing so has been shown to change the way children picture scientists and allows them to see themselves as scientists. This is so important if we're going to attract a more diverse population, the future scientists. But why does that matter? So we have a moral and ethical responsibility to support everyone who is interested in science to meet their full potential. And it's good for science. Research has shown over and over that teams comprising people with diverse experiences and perspectives are better able to solve problems. I'm sure you've all had the experience of sitting in a room or a Zoom with like-minded people discussing an issue. Since you all agree, you're less likely to challenge one another's perspectives and think outside the box. It takes having people with different perspectives to really push us to reconsider our position to think differently about something and to put together truly new and exciting ideas. To be able to create this environment, we need to recruit and support a more diverse scientific community, to be a kaleidoscope of cultural backgrounds, life experiences, individual perspectives, and other characteristics that add variety and vitality to science. This will make us more innovative, provide better healthcare, more supportive academic spaces, and a greater trust in science. Who doesn't want that? But it's hard. Part of the solution is to expose children to scientists of different backgrounds and help them see themselves as scientists. 
And one of the programs that I would like to highlight is RISE, or Rockets for Inclusive Science Education. Kari will put the link in the chat for anyone that is interested in learning more about this program. This after-school program is led by our Astronomy and Astrophysics Department Head, Dr. Randy McIntyre, and immerses students from groups historically underrepresented in the science, in hands-on physics, astronomy, and engineering. These students build rockets with sensor suite payloads that they launch, and then they collect the data for analysis. This allows these students to create a scientific identity and envision themselves as professionals in these fields. And this group is expanding to partner, including with HBCUs, where we can bring together students through Penn State to connect and collaborate and compare notes about what it's like to be a scientist. Another way we achieve this, many of you will be familiar with our Science U camps. This is the only summer camp my kid really, really loved. And we have just collaborated with WPSU to bring this to you in your home. So Kari will drop the link in the chat for that for anyone who's interested. Part of the solution is changing how we teach science and what we teach. We have new teaching innovation awards in the college led by Dean Mary Beth Williams, which support teaching approaches that include those that highlight the diversity of scientists that have made important contributions to their fields, many of whose stories go unheard. Part of the solution is to change our practices to make them more equitable and create a support structure and sense of belonging for everyone in the sciences. Our Office for Diversity and Inclusion under the leadership of Dean Kristen Finch is working to do just that. One exciting initiative includes the Pre-Health Summer Bridge Program, which will be launching this year to support incoming first year students interested in a medical career with marginalized identities and help them to succeed with the ultimate goal of diversifying the future healthcare workforce to address healthcare disparities in underrepresented groups. So more to come about that. So there's lots of work to do, but some exciting things to keep an eye on. So what does a scientific leader look like? Here are some of my Big Ten Science Dean colleagues. I never saw leadership as a career option for me. And I hope that being in this position helps others see themselves here too. Like many of you in the audience, I have a deep connection with Penn State and the Eberly College of Science has been so important to my development as a scientist. And that's what I saw as my contribution. Someone who is passionate about science, making new discoveries about the world around us and sharing that excitement with the students and with the community. To be honest, I didn't know what a PhD was until I graduated from my undergrad degree. I got into research because a professor, Lynn Schwarzkopf, gave a guest lecture in one of my undergraduate courses that I was taking. She spoke about how pregnant female lizards, and these are live bearing lizards, can't run fast anymore. And so they have to entirely shift their anti-predator strategies and their behavior and their physiology. This was so cool and I really wanted to be involved. I got the opportunity to join her lab and this exposed me to scientific research as a career. I was going to be a dolphin trainer. My PhD mentor, Professor Rick Shine, then helped me understand the impact that I could have in academia through research and teaching and mentoring. And how cool it was to spend time in the forest watching animals and figuring out how they perceive their world and respond to changes in their world. Here I am with my little field helper when he was six years old and one of my students at our field site in Alabama. And he especially loved working on the Mexican jumping beans, which you can see they're bopping around slowly uh, on the right. They're not bopping. They should be bopping. Anyway, um, Kari will drop the link to my research page 
um, in the chat if anyone wants to learn more about that. So this brought me to the US for a postdoc. I was so scared. I remember visiting my mom before I left Australia. I was so worried about starting a postdoc at Yale. What if I didn't live up to their expectations? What if I failed in my research? Terrifying. But again, I had great supporters, including undergraduate students that joined me on my first research trips and worked with me to help figure out what we were doing. It was super hard and incredibly rewarding. And then I got a job at Penn State in the biology department. Now this was clearly written in the stars because although it's a little dark, you might recognize that my husband was wearing a Penn State t-shirt as we climbed a volcano in Vanuatu before we moved to the US. This is my dream job. I get to interact with amazing collaborators, do exciting research, and work with fantastic students. I found my niche, research, mentoring, teaching, sharing the excitement of science, her set. And then our senior associate dean of curricular and instruction, Dean Mary Beth Williams, gave me my first exposure to leadership through a Tom Bros fellowship in the college focused on undergraduate research, which I was so deeply passionate about. This gave me a peek behind the curtain at the impact that I could have in leadership and was so exciting. The seed was planted. Our previous dean, many of you may know, Doug Kavanagh, was also a great mentor. He hired me as an assistant professor, and it was an honor to subsequently follow in his footsteps as the department head of biology. But actually what convinced me to apply for this position as department head was a meeting I had with teaching faculty after this job was posted. They were talking about such exciting ideas about how to effectively engage students in the classroom and had so much passion for our educational mission, the thought of being able to support this was inspiring and convinced me to throw my hat in. Being department head of biology was so rewarding, so much so that I almost didn't even apply for Dean because I didn't wanna leave that job. I'm really glad I did. I miss biology, but I have the best job in the world. I get to support amazing people doing remarkable things, creating new knowledge across all the life and physical and sciences and math. And I've learned so much about these new research areas. I get to work with the next generation of scientists, scientists and leaders. And I get to learn from our amazing alumni. Whenever I start feeling the weight of the world, I think of all of the members and friends of the college that give so much to allow us to succeed. And it truly restores my faith in humanity. It's been a true joy of the job. So I'm here because of mentors who believed in me, encouraged me and helped me see what I could not. Without these mentors, men and women, I wouldn't be in this exciting position of leading the Eberly College of Science. I'm proud to be the first woman since its founding. I'm proud to celebrate all of the amazing people that have contributed to the success of the college. I recognize my privilege and I'm dedicated to using it to create a diverse and equitable community in the college. COVID has brought, among other things, a shift in our workforce, this great resignation. And we will need to find future scientists and leaders by engaging the entire population, women and men, all races and ethnicities, first generation, those with disabilities, adult learners, and those taking more traditional paths. We know that some groups may be more likely to self-select out and not see them in these positions. And we need to provide opportunities for everyone to be able to see themselves as scientists and be supported in meeting their goals. And we're finding some ways to do this. For example, for Black History Month, we're featuring Black scientists and celebrating diversity and equity in STEM, which is on right now. And Kari can drop the link to that for anyone who is interested in engaging. And I hope that 
me being in this role will help change our perception of science leaders and make others see this as a viable career path. The tide is turning. There are many dedicated and invested people at Penn State working to create a more inclusive environment in STEM where everyone can thrive and contribute. From showing K-312 students what a scientist really looks like and helping them see themselves there, to supporting students at Penn State in becoming scientists and applying more inclusive pedagogies in our classrooms, to giving scientists a chance like I had to experience how rewarding leadership can be. Diversifying STEM will take hard work and a group effort and we will all be better for it. Thanks. Paul, back over to you. Thank you, Tracy. We are opening it up for questions. If you have questions for Dean Lankilda, you can drop them in the question Q and A tab at the bottom of your console. Um, but let's let's start uh, just with a, a couple questions that that I have. First, are the barrier are the barriers that keep women from pursue or girls from pursuing STEM the same for um, underrepresented groups, or is it is it more nuanced? There's still a lot of research going on in this in these areas. Um, I think a lot of it is stereotypes. So this links back to what we see scientists like, right? So if people see themselves in our scientific population, then they are more likely to engage and be able to show their amazing potential. Um, there is also some really interesting research that shows that if students are primed with stereotypes that enforce their ability as a scientist, they perform better. If they're primed with stereotypes that suggest they are not well represented in science, they perform worse in exams. So all of this, this perception and this um, these stereotypes change who engages and change how well we do, which is totally separate from ability and aptitude. Absolutely. I thought it was interesting how you talked about the role of the role of women in STEM and, and serving as mentors and helping others to see themselves in, in the field. Uh, but what can other people do like parents out there who might be watching this? Right. I was a uh, I was a history major. Right. But how can we encourage our children uh, to pursue the sciences? What, what can what can others do? Oh, yeah. My parents were not scientists and I fell in love with nature just because we went camping and we went walking on the beach and we'd watch documentaries so I could figure out what the weird little thing I found on the beach did. So I think parents play a huge role. Talk to your kids about science, enroll them in Science U or do the WPSU Science U at home experiments with them. Like just expose them to how important and how exciting scientist is, science is. And men play an incredibly important role. Right? Women can't and shouldn't do this by ourselves. So having men excited about science and excited about making science belong to everyone is critical in us being able to achieve our goals. One of the things that we've done um, has been to get involved with Center County 4-H. And I think um, when people think of when people think of 4-H, they think of the traditional right, agricultural origins of 4-H. Of uh, but what we found and what my daughter has found a home in has been the, the Center County uh, robotics team that, that, is, that is here in the county and competes um, nationally and internationally. Uh, but it's, it's, it's exposing your children to things like Science U uh, and those, those things that kind of open up a new world to them. Uh, but it's also, you know, it's been interesting to watch her journey through it now the past six years. She's a senior in high school. Mm -hmm. The responsibility that she has taken on to make sure that there are other girls and other women involved uh, with Center County 4-H, that's kind of become her thing to encourage people to join. Oh, that's awesome. It is. Uh, question coming in here. What is one piece of advice you could offer young people in pursuit of the seemingly elusive notion of balance, right? Trying to balance your professional life, um, you know, for, for some, right, in academia, it might be 
the balance between teaching and research. For, for others, it might be that work-life balance that they're trying to seek. How have you been able to find balance throughout your career? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I am still experimenting as a scientist, uh, and I can only share my experiences and recognize this might not resonate with everyone, but it's hard. I think, firstly, we need to recognize that we cannot do everything and keep everybody happy. So we need to prioritize. Um, I always think of it as we're juggling, we're always juggling balls. Some of them are rubber, and if we drop them, it's okay. We'll find them in the corner later, or we can catch them on the way back up. Some of them are glass, and if we drop that one, it's going to have devastating consequences. So we need to think about what is important to us and our career path, what is critical to keep moving forward, and what we have some flexibility in. Some things can't wait. Sometimes that's family. Sometimes that's a work engagement, but there's hard decisions always. Um, I will say, I'm sure many of you have heard that phrase about put your own mask on first. I finally embraced this a few years ago and it is incredible. It has made me, I mean, I felt guilty the whole time in the first few months because I was like, I shouldn't be going for a run. I should be spending time with my family or writing a paper or, but it has made me a better leader and a better member of our family and just giving myself energy so that I have energy to give back. So look after yourself, make hard decisions, and then you just need to figure out what can give. Yeah, it's, um, we were talking about this when we were, when we were off air and uh, that people think of these, these circles that they're trying to find balance in as almost um, not connected, right? Where it's actually their kind of overlapping Venn diagrams of, um, of you know, you can try to find ways to mm -hmm. be social and have fun in the work environment, right? You could try to find ways to incorporate family into what might be traditional, you know, work experiences. Mm -hmm. I know working in higher education, for example, my, my children have been coming to Penn State alumni events, you know, since they've been, since they've been little kids. And so um, it's, it's trying to not necessarily put three hours in this bucket and four hours in this bucket, right? But try to find how there, there might be some overlaps um, to find some balance with, within the buckets that you happen to be in. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, bringing my son into the field at the field station in Alabama was not always smooth, but it was such a great bonding experience. And he loved going out and checking out lizards. And so that allowed me to spend some time in the field while, I mean, we had complicated childcare issues and um, my mom's in Australia. So we would often coordinate her visits with a scientific conference. So her and my son would come with me to a conference and I'd spend some time at talks and some time touring around Oregon or whatever with them. So you're right. You, sometimes you need to be creative and just figure out how to blur those boundaries. Uh, you talk about the time that you spent in Australia. Mm -hmm. are, are issues of um, kind of gender barriers in, in the sciences, is, that, is it a United States problem or is that an international problem? It's an international problem. Um, Australia has some additional interesting challenges of, they call it the tall poppy syndrome, where if, if one rises too high, you try and lop their head off and put them back in line. So I think they're, I mean, every, every country has its unique challenges, right? And so I think gender is um, a balance in science and not, it's not even just gender. I think is a worldwide challenge. And then there's additional cultural things that might exacerbate that, like um, certain groups of people not wanting to be too visible and not being able to take leadership positions, for example. You know, as you've come into this position as the Dean of the Eberly uh, College of Science, diversity, equity, and inclusion has been something that you've publicly stated as being a priority for you as the Dean and a priority for the college. Can you talk a little bit about your, more about your commitment and specific strategies that you're employing? Yeah, so, so I was actually originally born in South Africa and moved to Australia when I was nine and then came over here for a postdoc. 
So I've had experiences in different countries where it's been very obvious that certain groups of people didn't have the same opportunities. Um, I, like I alluded to, I wouldn't be here except that there were the right people at the right time telling me, no, no, you should try this. This would be cool. And so really this is like many of our alumni, the reasons they give back is because they want to pay forward opportunities that have helped them succeed. So this is my way of wanting to pay back and help include people that might not have been, had the opportunity to be engaged in science if it weren't for the right people in the right place, encouraging and supporting them. I wonder if you might give us a little bit more of an insight on um, kind of the, the high level points of pride for the college. Uh, one of the things that I was surprised um, that I learned about uh, Everly College is that there's actually more medical research going on in the College of Science than there is in the College of Medicine. Now, it's not to throw shade at all on the College of Medicine. There's an awful lot of research going on across Penn State, but kind of um, in intuitively, I had just assumed that maybe it was the College of Medicine that was leading the way in terms of research, but it's actually your college. Yeah, I think this has been one of the things I've really loved as Dean. So as department head of biology, I got to know a lot of the really cool biological research that was going on. And now I've got to learn about our research into black holes and um, curing diseases and data sciences and security. And I mean, all of the incredible things that we're doing across, across the college. Um, I think research is one of our major points of pride and is really tightly integrated into our research. So our tenure line faculty teaching classrooms engage undergraduate students in their research, which I mean, over my career, I've had almost 50 undergraduates doing research in my lab. And it brings such value, kind of thinking about diversity of perspectives our undergraduate students will often throw ideas out that we would never have thought of and will take research in really exciting new directions. So our research is really what we pride ourselves in and using that as a framework to be able to train the next generation of, of scientists. And that's broadly defined, right? Um, we've been thinking a lot about our pre-med students at the moment because our uh, long time pre-med director Ron Markle is getting ready to retire and so we are faced with having to fill his very big shoes and so we've been thinking about how we prepare our students for the medical field and I've been reaching out to several alum for examples and, and they've been really helpful. Um, how we can connect these students across the different colleges because not all pre-med students come through science right and so, again, it's bringing students together across the colleges to share different perspectives and discuss some really hairy problems in, in the medical world is really important. I've been thinking a lot as COVID starts mm, showing some signs of at least temporarily waning, and we've been able to send students back on international trips. I've been thinking a lot about how we can expand those experiences for our students for me, going to an international conference was life-changing. And I know our students that do our study abroad courses come back with experiences that they never thought they would have. And so really thinking about how we can expand our education beyond the bounds of Penn State and the country to give our students some really interesting experiences and make connections. Yeah, it's, a, it's an important point that you bring up about um students entering medical school, not all coming from a biology background or a pre-med pre background. Uh, all you have to do is go to a white coat ceremony um, and, and hear the, where the, what the students studied and there's mechanical engineers and there's English literature. Um, it's, it's fascinating the paths that, uh, that people take to, uh, to medical school. Yeah. Question coming in from the audience, uh, what do you have to say about the amount of effort it takes to be a science in terms of education and experience versus the recognition and compensation on, <laughs> on the other side of it? Yes, another way to say it is, uh, why work so hard for so little? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, and I think the recognition and income you get depends on the sort of science that you do. Um, 
many of our alumni have gone on to be really quite successful and being able to share that to help our students of need. Um, but those of us in academia, maybe not so much. And so I think you often hear you don't become a scientist for the money, you would do something else. So I think people in academia do it because they love the, I mean, it's, it's like being an explorer. We get to learn things first. We get to discover things that nobody else in the world knows about. And it's just this be, being able to feed this curiosity, being able to engage curious students. And I mean, just watching those aha moments in the classroom or in the research lab with students um, is worth its weight in gold. Absolutely. You know, one of the other fascinating points about, uh, about Penn State really is, you know, I, I mentioned the research that goes on um, in the medical school versus Eberly, but it's not a it's it's not a competitive state, right? A lot of the a lot of what Penn State has become known for is um, collaboration on research, whether it's through one of our centers or maybe more notably the Huck Institute. Can you talk about how that kind of environment is is fostered here at Penn State yeah, in terms of yeah. fostering collaboration? I would love to. Um, so if I had to pick the one thing that I that has kept me at Penn State all this time, it's the ability to do interdisciplinary collaborations. It is just as easy for me to co-mentor a student or share a piece of equipment or share a grant with someone in anthropology or agriculture or health and human development as it is someone in the lab next door. And I think this is just, it's, there's a structure there that supports this, but it's just this culture. Like, people love it. Our faculty and our students love it. And I have students that have uh, access to labs all over campus because they wanted to do, I mean, often these, these things are driven by our, by our students and our postdocs because they'll say, oh yeah, this is fun, but I want to do this. And we're like, ooh, I don't, that's kind of stretching the bounds of my knowledge. So we'll help you go find some people that can help you test that piece. And that's what drives new research directions. I think Part of it, so coming back to the structure, part of it is our institutes. So they are designed specifically to support inter interdisciplinary research. So they're not like colleges and departments. They don't, they're not faculty homes and they don't have to worry about all of those pieces. Their job is to just support through instruction and help make co-hires happen. And our inter-college graduate degree programs help bring people together from across traditional boundaries. And actually, we were noted, so there was a group of researchers doing research on this, and they found that there was only one university that did that properly, and then they reached out and asked if they could use Penn State's name, to which we said, yes, please. So we have been identified as the only place that is doing this kind of interdisciplinary um, cluster hiring, building collaborations thing properly, and it's, I mean, interdisciplinary research is not easy, but it feels easy at Penn State. I th you know, one of the other things that I think differentiates Penn State from our other Big Ten colleagues, which are all, for the most part, really large uh, public research institutions, you know, with the exception of, of Northwestern, uh, is Penn State's kind of, um, you know, the, the, it seems like we have cornered the market on providing undergraduate research opportunities. Uh, you know, our Big Ten brethren, right, you think of the research that goes on, a lot of that is reserved for graduate school and, and post-grad, uh, but at Penn State, there's there's really, uh, um, I think it's one of the, ni the niches that we have here is the ability for our undergraduate students to get that kind of real-world research experience. Can you talk a little bit about those opportunities for our students? Yeah, so that was actually what opened the door to leadership for me, was this ability to to learn more about how our students get engaged in research and uh, think about ways that we can make this accessible to more students. So I agree. I think this is such a cool aspect of Penn State. And we just wanted to make sure that it wasn't just the students that were really persistent and confident and kept asking again and again if they could get into the lab that had those opportunities, but that other students that would really benefit from it but may not quite know how to approach it were able to do this as well. Um, so yeah, and, and they, they get involved in real research, right? 
This is, and in fact, even some of our classroom labs are working, moving away from kind of predetermined labs to more of these exploratory. We have a first year research initiative program, which gets students in their very first year to do exploratory research. In the fall, they learn some of the techniques that they'll need. And then in the spring, they work with a faculty to design hypotheses and test them and figure out what, like they come up with their own questions. They, they're scientists in their very first year. Um, I have had multiple undergraduate students be first authors on papers because they came up with the idea and they figured out how to test it and they read the literature and figured out how to interpret it. Yeah, amazing. Can, can you share a little bit about your own personal leadership journey? Uh, I, I think it's, it's one thing to go from one institution to another, right? If you were to go off to another institution to become a dean, yeah. but you've risen to become a dean and now you are the dean with presumably people that um, you've been friends with over the, over the many years. How has that, um, how has that leadership transition and, and journey been for you? How have you approached that? Yeah, that's a really interesting um, conversation. I am so glad this happened because I didn't want to leave Penn State. So I was like, if I have to leave Penn State to be dean somewhere else, I don't know. But you're right. It's it. Some of my mentors, um, I have had to have really complicated conversations with, and I think the approach has just been to be honest and open and say, this is going to be kind of awkward, but I just need to understand what's happening here. Um, I think it's been an adjustment for everybody. I think the first couple of months, everyone's kind of settling into a new groove um, and shifting into Dean was a whole new ball game because it was in the middle of COVID, right? So I feel like my first year as Dean was like a video game. It was just moving boxes around on a screen and writing emails. And so this last six months or so has been much better. I've get to, got to see people um, in 3D. Uh, people often comment how tall I look on Zoom. Not very tall in real life. So, <clears throat> so that was fun to set um, expectations on camera. But yeah, it's been so nice being able to go and connect with, because many of the faculty as Dean, I didn't know, and I've not met before because they were in different departments. So it's been really nice being able to wander around and see some of our labs and talk to faculty about what they're doing or their theory groups um, and get to see some of our alumni in real life. It's been amazing. This edition of the virtual speaker series is actually made possible through a generous donation of Matt and Karen Keller. Um, longtime supporters of the college, longtime supporters of the Penn State Alumni Association. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the importance of alumni involvement uh, with the college and, and in your role as the dean? Yeah, critical um, in so many ways. Uh, one that I've been exploring a lot more at the moment. So our students are not all going to be academics, clearly. They shouldn't be. We are not, we're training scientists to do the breadth of science. But when our students come to us and say, I want to go into industry, we are not the experts and don't always have the best advice for them. So uh, one of the upsides of COVID is we've all become incredibly competent at remote technology. And so our alumni have been zooming into classrooms to be able to give a little bit of background on their career trajectories or like they used to sit in that gen chemistry class not knowing what they wanted to do and now they're a patent lawyer for example and so using our alumni to be able to share their experiences to inspire our students and expose them to the career opportunities that are out there for them is really key um, they also have amazing all of you have amazing experiences to share so I have got some really valuable counsel from many of our alumni that serve in high leadership positions on just like what what should I not do in my first year and how to increase chances of success and dream big so personally um, alumni advice has been really incredible and then obviously as we're coming to the close of our campaign 
alumni donations have allowed our students to succeed when I know many of them personally were about to drop out of science and college. And these gifts, gifts from people to someone that they don't know. These students are always like, they don't know me. They're helping me and they don't know me. Like life changing, right? Um, right. And support for programs. Like there are things that we would love to do, but are outside of the scope of our funding resources. And so we've been able, a lot of the things I spoke, to, uh, spoke about today were made possible by generous donors. Yeah, we have heard so so often over the years that reaction from students, right? Why why are you giving me money? And and the reaction of our donors has been has been priceless. It's because I'm investing in the younger version of me, right? I remember what it was like to be in your shoes or to be in that lab or to, you know, to struggle to pay for my education. We don't want you to have to go through the same things we did to have this Penn State experience. And so I think, I know that's uh, among the motivations behind Matt and Karen's philanthropy and, and many, of our, uh, many of our donors across, uh, across Penn State. Uh, I am, we could probably go on forever, but we are coming up on, on our time here. But I wanna just say thank you to you for spending some time with us this afternoon. And, um, and to spread the good news of everything that's going on at the Everly College of Science. We're uh, excited to see where you take the college and we're truly grateful that you spent some time with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. It has been so great being part of this. And we wanna thank everybody tuned in. Uh, that's all the time that we have for today, but we wanna thank the Dean for joining us. Also wanna thank you who have tuned into the virtual speaker session. I know many of you out there are members of the Alumni Association. And for that, we're truly grateful. If you're not a member of the Penn State Alumni Association, the world's largest alumni association, what are you waiting for? Go to our website at alumni.psu.edu and you too can become a member of the world's largest alumni association. Thanks again. Thanks for all you do for the university, for the glory and for the future. We are Penn State.